There are some Disney Channel movies that exhibit thoughtful screenwriting and innovative filmmaking techniques that make them instant classics. And there is also 2006's Read It and Weep, a rushed, forgettable little film that was named after me receiving my hepatitis A test results that one time. In this movie, high school freshman Jamie is totally embarrassed when her personal private journal becomes a published book. Even though it contains no personally identifying information and she's the only person exposing herself. That was your journal? Yes. Are we in the book? Yes. Is this based on real events? Oh, I couldn't make that stuff up. It seems like she could have just not told anybody that the work was autobiographical. You don't see me letting the whole world know that the movie Grumpy Old Men was titled after my first three Craigslist hookups. Wow, I guess it is kind of hard not to brag about that stuff. Today, we're analyzing the most formulaic and uninteresting decom I've encountered so far, which uses outdated technology to try to spice up a plot that seems like it was decided using tarot cards cards, and a final edit that feels like it was done by someone experiencing withdrawal symptoms. Toss in some poorly developed story beats and two-dimensional characters, and it's time to doodle our feelings and double check our email attachments in another installment of Clip Breakdown. <laughs> Hello television viewers, my name is Nick. Thank you so much for joining me once again on my channel for another installment of Clip Breakdown. This is the playlist where we dive in to our favorite movies, TV movies, and other content on the web, and we break it down like the parts of a sentence and look at each individual subject and participant and we say, ugh, why did they do it that way? And ugh, when is it over? And I felt that all throughout this movie. It was recommended we look at Read It and Weep after I covered that other one with Dan Danielle Panabaker in it. And now we got her sister involved in this whole mess too. Why don't we get their stage mom to come down here and take a shit on this desk? Maybe we can have a family affair. But before we get into it, make sure you give this video a big thumbs up if you wanna see even more clip breakdowns on a Disney Channel original movie like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week, so turn on notifications. If you always wanna know when we've got a mother taking a dump on the desk. I've also got merch available and a page Patreon where you can access exclusive bonus content and watch parties. But I mean, let's just get right into the clips because mama, my inner peace is at risk. That's all I'm gonna say. Meet Isabella, but you can call her Is. High school, a fantastical kingdom with warriors, wizards, and witches. Okay, so once again, Mrs. O, who works at the library, is not a witch just because a house collapsed on her sister, and she's let you know that it triggers her when you bring it up. Also, the movie makes it seem like this girl just wrote the Game of Thrones in Latin because she compares her high school experience to Dungeons and Dragons or whatever. That's not that creative. Jamie spent one day at the Renaissance Fair and suddenly she's hammering steel and covered with leprosy scars. Also, you'll notice they just kind of introduced Iz here, and it feels really disjointed from the rest. She's like, here Here's Isabella, or Is, the coolest girl in the school. The school is full of demons. Like, but Is looked like a normal girl in a normal school. Her journal is stupid. So basically, you can see that our main girl, Jameson, or Jamie, she works out her feelings in her little tablet, which is like a Windows tablet from nowheresville.org. These didn't catch on. But she's like, oh, I might not be good at gym class, but my alter ego is Is. They told the camera operator, so the bad news is you will also be dangling from a rope while we shoot this part, so just hang on tight and try to use your spine to protect the camera when you fall. These earthquake images are actually a very good reminder to never, ever, 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 ever shake a baby, which I'm surprised has never become a top 40 hit. We're gonna never, ever, ever, ever shake a baby. Never, ever, ever, ever shake a baby. It's good advice. You don't want to shake a baby. Anyway, Jamie is not nearly as coordinated as her fictional character is, and we see that she's kind of an outcast as a freshman high schooler. This is the story of how my private personal journal became a bestseller. And that's what the whole movie's about. So if it doesn't sound interesting to you, it would be a good time to switch over to House Hunters International. I appreciate them not trying to waste my time, but it's too late. I already watched it. Also, that line is a reference to the young adult novel that this movie is based off of, which is essentially how my personal private journal became a bestseller. According to IMDb, the book, in 
the movie have a lot of differences, which I can only hope. This whole screenplay is more generic than Jamie's magical tablet, which by today's standards looks hilariously awkward and bulky. Anyway, let's meet Jamie's friends, Harmony and Lindsay. The planet is a theater downtown and they're gonna tear it down unless we do something about it. What are we gonna do? Buy up all the matinee tickets for the rest of the year? You already owe me a quarter from last month's bake sale, so you can f right off with this adventure. Also, Disney Channel, this is like your 19th movie from this time period that revolves around trying to save some significant community building from being torn down. And I'm just not sure it gives an accurate understanding of how private construction actually works. I say if this theater can't figure out that they need to play Marvel movies on the weekend in order to turn a profit, let's rip it apart so we can finally have a Cold Stone Creamery in this town. These two friends are clearly very interested in all sorts of social justice. Justice. Never really one cause, just like a million causes, so that doesn't get bothersome. And you know, since it's a movie, there's gotta be a mean girl. Ugh. Every movie was bad for girls. Like, it was teaching us that it was so normal for there to be one girl in your school who was mean to everybody. The evil and fear Sawyer. Uh, I mean, Myrna. Myrna was rotten to the core. I'm sorry, did you want something? Yes, I wanted you to move, you're blocking my locker. Oh, I'm sorry, we actually exist in a 360 degree space, so you could forge a path to either the left or the right of me, but I should have known looking at that flat ass hair, you weren't really great at grasping all three dimensions. God, they make high school seem fun in movies. I would be so mean. I'm ready to be mean, invite me to your prom. But for real, I love this main antagonist, Sawyer. She is fierce in literally every scene. If I were in school with her, I'd be like, listen, you're kind of a I'm kind of a we should team up and go walk around Target during gym class. Sawyer is played by Allison Scagliotti of Warehouse 13 and Vampire Diaries. I know there are probably fans of her out there watching. So in Jamie's little dream sequence, we see what it looks like for is to zap the uh, popular girls into permanent detention. She just kind of makes them disappear. But Jamie's a daydreamer, a writer, an artist. Jamie, is there something you'd like to share with the class? No, Miss Gallagher. Then pay attention. All right, grumpy, frumpy, Mrs. Dumpy. Maybe you can just ask her to put away that diesel-powered iPad that she's been using to doodle her little dissociation fantasies. I remember seeing bits of this when it came out and I was like, no teacher would just let you have your big computer thing on the desk. Like we weren't even allowed to bring our Tamagotchis into class. Ugh, it was so annoying. We meet the love interest of this movie. Marco, you're next. not very good. <laughs> Look at the way he has this class eating out of his hand. They're like, oh, Marco, you could read that poem and then commit a mass shooting and it would still get printed in the New York Times. Nobody gets a better PR spin than a skinny white boy murderer who writes about his feelings. That's mainstream American media for you. In the land of the free. We meet this like moppy headed guy who is in some other Disney Channel things. You can tell he's like the sweet, sensitive friend of Jamie and the girls who has a secret flame he's nursing for the main character of the movie. But none of that matters right now because we have to go back to Jamie's after school job at her dad's pizza shop. Liver and onion pizza. Oh, oh you're not making that for the slumber party, are you? But I'm trying to appeal to a wider audience. Explain to me how your plain cheese pizza is not already accomplishing that for you. I'm not in the pizza biz, but I feel like that's usually the biggest crowd pleaser. They make the dad's hunt for a unique pizza topping the main struggle of his business for the entire movie, and it all feels really thrown in and half-baked. Because frankly, when is that any pizza place's issue? Like, unless they could have built in for me, like, oh, the big pizza chain Dominark's Parza is coming out with their new gold-laced leaf pizza, and we can never compete unless we come up with a gimmicky topping. You know, they don't give us any of that, so I don't get any of that. And then when I don't get any of that, I'm left hungry for that. And then when I'm left hungry for that, I go crazy and I start yelling. Oh no. <laughs> I just glurped that liquid like it was my nectar. I said, <laughs> Okay, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie. This movie is just not fun. I'm like, where is the fucking movie? It's just a bunch of nonsense. I said no eyes. Oh, my bad. Let me get you another.
I like your style is, oh, did that ice chunk just chip your collarbone? Looks like you better get in line at urgent care so it doesn't heal weird. So as you can see, Jamie has these sort of flashbacks to her alter ego being the brave person that she is not in her daily life. That night, the girls are having a sleepover and they all have to submit an essay to this essay writing contest for their English class. And Jamie wrote something about extending the break times between classes, but because she's not paying attention, she accidentally sends her personal journal file. I just thought you would have come up with something better than that. You are the best writer in the class. I'm not. If you're not a writer, then why are you writing all the time? Because if I didn't, I'd have a nutty. Oh, whaty? Listen, we said you can write good, but if you start making up new British sounding words, we're gonna bully you at school. This next scene just seems to further establish that Lindsay cares about the environment a lot. When did you start selling this makeup? Just last week, it's new. It's cruel. They test on animals, everybody knows that. You should be ashamed of yourself. Look kid, I just work here. That lady's like, we don't even make your shade of foundation, why do you care? Between Lindsay, Sawyer, and this outdoor makeup kiosk beauty consultant, I am a little bit into the girl boss energy that this movie exudes. Make that buck, save those whales, whatever you gotta do. I do find it a little, I guess, hard to get into because the whole saving the planet thing is basically just Lindsay's thing that Jamie goes along with and harm as well. I'm like, what does Jamie care about other than writing her little journal and her crush on Marco? All of these characters feel like out of arm's reach for me. They all feel like an idea of a character that never felt fully realized on the page. Do you make up in the dark this morning, girls? You could at least let us finish. I think it's better that you didn't finish because where exactly were we going with this makeup look? Lindsay saw her best friends painting their faces brown and she was like, um, we're leaving now, animal rights. Oh, so I should mention the file that Jamie submitted was actually being emailed to Lindsay so that Lindsay could print it out and hand it in for her. So in this next scene, Lindsay's like, that was such a long paper you printed out. And Jamie's like, it was only five pages. And that's when they realize, oh, I think you sent me the wrong file because the whole school is now freaking out over this controversial and provocative essay that won the English teacher's contest and is being printed in the school newspaper. Seems a little weird that Jamie won this contest and there was time to have it printed in the newspaper the next day before anyone even told her. But hey, she also won a thousand dollars savings bond, so. Myrna and her evil clip were no match for Isabella. With a flick of her finger, she would sap them into perpetual detention. Cute comic book, but won't this piss off the kids who wrote an actual essay? for this contest. You know, some 10th grader is like, I studied this town's sewage system for eight months, but sure, I guess I should have just broke out Microsoft Paint and copied the Amelia's Notebook series that they sold at the fifth grade book fair. So even though this was Jamie's personal journal, nobody in the school knows that. They just think it's an amazing story about fictional things. Marco's pretty no cool. match for Isabella. With a flick of her finger, she would zap them into perpetual- Either your teacher is just reading the same chapter over and over again, again, or they just borrowed her audio from an alternate take of her first line in the scene. That's pretty cool. Oh, match for Isabella. With a flick of her finger, she would zap them into her Also, can we be honest? Throughout the movie, we hear just a few lines from this book, and it does not seem like the kind of story that high school-aged kids would be this interested in. Jamie wrote, I zapped the meanie into permanent detention, and the substitute was a warlock. And her English teacher was like, class, you better take out your copies of Catcher in the Rye and immediately wipe your ass with it. This is the new American classic. The powerful is and her gumdrop journey. At first, Jamie is just completely upset about this whole debacle, but she also gets these mixed feelings of pride. So inspiring. I know. Next time Rachel calls me a cow, I'm gonna zap her. Is she gonna use a taser on Rachel? She said, I'm about to fry her ass till it's medium rare. Then who's the cow? Also, why are both of these featured extras dressed like Patty Simcox from Grease? What does this girl even mean? Next time Rachel calls me cow, I'm gonna zap her. What would that mean in real life? You're just gonna say zap to her and that's gonna make you the new cool girl? <sighs> Not very well thought through if you're asking me. Connor is like always following right behind. He's very much like, pick me, pick me. No, I was just publicly humiliated when my journal was read in front of the entire class. Whoa, 
That was a journal? I guess it was a journal in the sense that it was her personal writings. But if she really never meant for anybody to see it, then why was she proactively changing their names and fictionalizing the event? Jamie accidentally submitted this novel for publication the same way I accidentally sent that seductive photo to the Postmate driver who brought me an extra dipping sauce. Oops, sorry, I dropped my phone and it snapped a pic of me pushing my chest meat together and it sent it to you on accident. Oh, where's the dipping sauce for these fillets? Where's the dipping sauce for these fillets of chicken? White meat chicken. <laughs> this movie's making me lose it. This is where I really start to get mad. An undetermined amount of time passes by and Jamie's mom is like, oh, they wanna write a book based on your thing. You got an agent. A book? I just don't know. I mean, the humiliation has just died down and I can't survive another lunch of zapping. Well, we forgot to press record on the camera during that scene, so thank you for verbally describing it. I'm not sure if a cafeteria full of people zapping is something that they shot and then cut, or if she mentioned it and then someone on set was like, that sounds like it requires a lot of kids. Let's not do it. The mom is basically like, this is an incredible opportunity. They just want you to write some more pages to this story so that they can make it a full length book. Jamie's like, I don't have any other pages, even even though she has a whole lifetime of journals to pull from. No more pages? What do you call those? Personal property. I can't do it, no way. Jamie, you can't walk away from this just because you're scared. I'm not scared. I am scared. I think her dad might have left the car running in the garage directly underneath her bedroom because that's the only way to explain this requiem for a dream ass editing. Did that just make anyone else feel like when you're having a dream and your mom turns into your music teacher? This is the first time that Jamie begins to have like a conversation with an imagined version of Is, which continues throughout the movie. So I hate how they kind of introduce it in this scattershot way where it's like she just jumps into the scene all of a sudden and Jamie starts facing all these directions. Like it doesn't feel right. Couldn't they have used that zap device where it's like the stars in the little starburst kind of appears and makes someone reappear like she did with the popular girls? Couldn't they have like is zap in and out of the room at the worst time so that way we have that sort of traditional thing where the main character sees someone that no one else can see and she's like, not now. And everyone's like, not now. Like they try to do that this whole movie, but Iz just appears and disappears like a literal ghost. So it's always awkward. I don't know why they did that. It was, it's like, it feels like she's never properly introduced as a figment of Jamie's imagination. And then in an equally rushed way, she just like writes the book and they la di da that. In two short months, the pipe dream had become a nightmare and my personal private journal was on its way to becoming a national bestseller. Hmm, a book written by a 15 year old in the span of two months that includes lots of illustrations. Well, at least it's gonna be a quick read. Also not Jamie being like, so I accepted the book deal and then began my horrible nightmare of having this amazing opportunity of becoming a best-selling author. Like sweetie, you officially can't act like this is a bad embarrassing thing anymore. Just own the media story and sell your stupid kids book. They give us little glances into the book. It seems like they made it a graphic novel type thing and the the public loves it and the more that the public loves it somehow the more Jamie hates it I'm like isn't this a good thing for you now I don't get Jamie's motivation through all of this she gets convinced to do the book so she must have at some point become more excited about it it's like no one's forcing you to do this what have I done? started a revolution See, like how does having that happen add anything to this movie? As a kid, I remember always being impressed that Disney Channel had 12 new movies come out every year, but this one feels like it might've snuck up on them a little bit. It was fully June 14th and they were like, oh shit we forgot to write a movie for next month. In fact, how much do you want to bet that they cast real life sisters, Danielle and Kay Panabaker as Iz and Jamie, just to save on the time and expense of having the same actor play both versions. Okay, I'm glad we all love the story, but I'm a little concerned for the reading retention at this school, just because that's not the way I've ever seen teenagers consume written material. Zap, zap. Zap, zap, 
What's up? If I was at that school, I'd be like, can everyone please look where they're going and keep your little Harry Potter hand motions to yourself because I'm just trying to get down to the chorus room without anyone touching me. Meanwhile, back at the pizza shop where Jamie and every single one of her friends work, business is finally starting to happen. Business has not been this good since we stopped serving wheatgrass pizza. You don't think the sign has anything to do with it, do you? I do not, because that sign is indoors and very hard to read. In case you couldn't tell that this movie was low budget, they're trying to convince us that Jamie is a world famous author now with a chalkboard and copies of her headshot from an inkjet printer. It doesn't feel right how they're trying to make it seem like all of this new pizza shop business is because Jamie works there, because it looks like the restaurant is filled with customers and not one of them is even looking at her or noticing that she's there. They could have really beefed this up in the script by being like, oh, the pizza shop was a central location in Jamie's story and it was like the powerful kingdom with the Zeus father and magical pizza toppings and exotic flavors like if they built it in that it made like people oh we gotta go see the crazy pops pizza shop and see what crazy flavors he comes up with next like she could have made the dad's weird eccentric pizza thing seem like something lovable and it would have made it like all catch on and become a fad that would have worked for this screenplay a lot better I think but instead they're just like all these people are here because Jamie, that unassuming girl, is carrying trays around. Do you guys see what I mean where it's like all of these ideas just feel like they were the first idea and they never fleshed it out any further? It's heart in my heart. You can tell Connor is jealous that Jamie has a crush on Marco, but I mean, sorry, bro. What's going to happen when they realize that the evil Myrna and the clones are really them? Get out. You're kidding. How else was I supposed to come up with a cheerleader who was so vile that milk curdled at the sound of her name? Wait, so you're saying that that actually happened and that's how you came up with it? The name Sawyer? can be used in cottage cheese production? Finally, a cost-effective way to liquidate some of that surplus breast milk in my freezer. Don't worry, it's from a cow, but the cow had breasts for some reason. I don't know, it was out in the valley. I hate the dialogue. She's like, of course I based that off Sawyer. How else would I have come up with a cheerleader so vile she makes milk curdle? It's like, well, you didn't. You just made up that simile, you know, or that metaphor, whatever. Are we in the book? You are Laura the Invincible, and you are the Magnificent Melody. But they're only the coolest kids in the kingdom. Yeah, it's mostly fiction. Baby, the book is about zapping mystical characters into time out. It's entirely fiction. What are you guys talking about? What are you talking about? What are you talking about? Does anybody in this movie even think about what they're saying before they say it? By the way, Harmony totally got the note in this scene that acting is reacting. She said, Nice background work there, sis. We love it. We love to see it. Obviously, some of the people who know that this book is based on reality are not so happy with Jamie, like her brother. I honestly don't remember if I've even mentioned that she has an older brother yet. He doesn't like her. He's such a non-character. Like, he's a little flavor of all of the older brother archetypes that you could have. Like, he's, oh, uh, he works at the store too. He thinks she's a nerd. He plays guitar. But that's his main thing. He's too nervous to play the guitar. It's pretty terrific. Not if you're Kenny the stinky troll. That's just a character in a book. Has no resemblance to you whatsoever. Maybe a little bit around the ears. Are you telling me this kid smells bad behind the ears? That's f***ing sick. He's making my pizza right now. I don't want Johnny Mildew and his extra mushrooms touching my food. Tell your son to grab a washcloth. Because if he's not scrubbing behind his ears, then you know his foreskin is f***ing Battlefield Earth. It's gonna be the landing in Normandy up in there dead fish just washing up on the shore. But right now we're just living in, you know, cloud nine because Jamie's book success is helping the family business. Business is booming. The family business is doing really well. And the family business is also thriving. So all of these things are happening. The business, the family business. Will you please not let my father know about that? He's so excited by the new business that I would hate for him to think that it's all about me. Even though it seems like it was him who put up the sign advertising your association to the restaurant, are you kids fucking kidding me right now? You just said that. It feels like they just kept making random changes trying to adapt this book into a movie that once they finally watched it, they were like, oh, this doesn't really make too much sense, does it? Well, thank goodness kids are stupid and their brains aren't important. It's like they don't really even know what conflicts they're gonna go with. They're like, oh, we can't let dad know that that it's all because of me. We have to make people think that it's the food. Then they never do that. Then she's like, oh, we gotta now suddenly work on this student dance thing. Like this 
idea is entirely hers. I'm so annoyed. Basically, Jamie and her friends go into school the next day and they're like recruited into helping on the dance committee for their deep blue sea dance. Jamie is like, you're both such great artists and organizers that we have to do it. It'll be so much fun. And I'm like, okay, since when does Jamie care about dancing? Even Iz says, oh, I guess since you're one of the popular girls now, you can start acting like them. So I'm guessing the popular girls work on the dances and that's why Jamie wants to do it, but they never really say it. It just feels like a book detail. So I don't know. So Jamie convinces them to join the dance committee. And then, you know, she continues to be a local celebrity. She's doing talk shows on television. Oh, and because of the deep blue sea dance, those two girls, Harmony, Lindsay, Jamie, and Connor decide to just go as a group of friends since none of them have a date. And then Connor goes to his older brother and is like, will you give me a ride and my friends a ride to the dance? Cause I don't want my dad to drive us. It's not cool. And the brother is like, well, you're gonna have to do my chores and my laundry for a whole month. And Connor is like, fine, only because I really love Jamie. Jamie, on the other hand, travels to New York and starts doing press for her book tour. So she's living the celebrity life. Great shot. I love how that blue tracksuit power clashes with the Dr. Seuss headband. Our wardrobe stylist couldn't make it today because she got hit with a subway train on the way over here. Great choices, Jamie. You're a star. So Jamie is living her rock star lifestyle, somehow appearing on like music television shows before to promote her book. Her and her mom are getting to rub elbows with the greats of Hollywood. It's George Jackson. I had all of his albums. Wait, is George Jackson Ice T's government name? Because that is Detective Finn Tutuola over there at the deli platter. There's this really random incident where Jamie gets her hair caught in a hair tiara with this other like socialite. And the girl's like all annoyed with her until these other girls on the show are like, I love your book. We, I was reading it on set. And then the celebrities like her. So it just shows, I guess, that Jamie's becoming popular. I wish that we could have spent the end of the first act having like stuff that matters to the plot happen instead of just like random celebrity characters who don't matter being introduced. Oh, I hate it. You're Ryder Donovan. You're Jameson Bartlett. Hi. Call me Jamie. Okay, Jamie. I'm a big fan. So do you like have a young child who reads her books or do you just have a low IQ from working in entertainment your whole life? This guy feels like one of those NFL player cameos, but it could also just be a real actor who lied on his resume about being able to smile naturally. This is him. <laughs> I'm sorry, are you clenching the pretzel sticks between your ass cheeks? Blah, 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 Jamie is bragging about how she's like a celebrity now. Connor is still doing all of his chores. We're at the end of the first act and I think we're supposed to see that Jamie is starting to become a little different. Ah yes, that purple headband that hasn't been incorporated into the movie at all yet. I know exactly what that's supposed to mean. Seriously, I don't get it. Maybe is is always wearing that headband? Let me find her. Is is yes, is is wearing a purple headband in that scene. Is the purple headband supposed to be like a trademark of is? I think it's supposed to show that Jamie is starting to like, oh, incorporate aspects of is's personality into her daily life. But again, I couldn't tell you. So we have to get the word out that you're gonna be at our animal rice rally next Thursday. You are coming, right? Of course I'm coming. I wouldn't miss it for anything in the world. I would never let you guys down. It's so beautiful witnessing the moment of conception for our third act conflict. It's like watching a sperm cell fertilize an egg or to be inclusive, a Republican leader crawling out of their nasty pus filled egg sack. When someone swears that they're going to be at an important event in one of the first acts of a children's movie, you know that character is literally more likely to die in a car crash than actually make it to that event without an issue. And that's a scategorical fact. Do you guys remember Marco? He's still there. So nice that you're doing this for. See that unsettling way they keep editing Isabella into the story? I vote for them to just cut her out completely and give me more of radical hair flip girl. That's me when a guy in a sleeveless shirt gets in line behind me at Starbucks, looking like a stressed out meerkat who just heard a poacher. Connor has to accept that uh, Jamie might not want to go to the dance with him as a group now because Marco guy kind of swept in and wooed her. And we start to see some of the cracks form in Jamie's ability to maintain a social life along with her new author lifestyle. Well, let's see you at the pizza parlor. 
Oh, I quit. Didn't we cover this? I thought my handler called you guys. <laughs> You're not serious. No, I'm joking. Well, maybe it's the truth. I, I thought I told someone. Oh, so the metallic paint on that headband is causing memory loss? We are gonna sue the hell out of that icing by Claire's. Then we'll be up to our nips and clip on earrings, ladies. Also, what was the point of her grabbing that headband before school if she didn't even put it on until she was walking home at the end of the day? We could have used this in third period when I couldn't see the board over your forest of flyaways. I would be the most toxic classmate ever. And I deserve the opportunity. <sighs> Again, this headband representing is taking over is really weak. Like we had them set up this whole thing of the zapping being a key aspect. Like there should be shit zapping in and out of her life all the time. And this part where she like kind of goes back and forth, she's like, no, I am joking. Well, maybe it's the truth. I'm like, what? I get that she's supposed to be like so unsure of the line between reality and fiction that it's like starting to bleed into real life, but they should be using Isabella to accomplish that. Like Isabella jumping into the conversation and being like, sounds like they're jealous. That's not true. Okay, but it is true. No, wait, I wasn't talking to you. Like use Isabella to show why she's being so confused not just like her actually changing her thoughts mid-sentence. Like that's just confusing for the audience. Ugh, the stupid pizza shop, it won't shut up. Now she's talking on the phone with some girl. Oh, Sawyer wants to be her friend now, who cares? Jamie feels alienated from her friends because she quit the pizza shop. Oh, and Connor is getting cheered up by his brother. Look, don't be like that, little bro. You like her, don't you? And you didn't wash my underwear for an entire month just to let some chump jump in and steal your girl, did you? Yeah, about that, you should probably start doing your own household chores since you're 47. He's like, come on, little bro. You said you would clean my hockey cleats before my 4 p.m. prostate exam. Like something feels off here. So Connor tries to call his girl, as the brother says, to get through to Jamie and ask her to the dance. What was cool work and all that? Hang on. Okay, can you hang on for one second? Give me two more seconds, okay? I'll, I'll be right back. Okay. The only thing more confusing than Jamie talking on two phones at once is the confusing editing of this scene. It's so unclear if she's ever telling Connor to hold on for two seconds or if she's talking to two random other people and he's just getting busy signals. Also, who could she possibly be talking to since all of her friends are ignoring her? Is it Sawyer? We don't see. I swear, if this movie were a dog, I would have it euthanized because that's how miserable its existence is. And more importantly, it's inconveniencing me, which is the number one reason to put down any animal. I'm obviously joking. I'm obviously joking about that. Ha <laughs> ha. Uh, uh, if you don't think that's funny, then I'll just smash my skull into a bloody pulp. Okay, so Connor can't get through to stupid Jamie. So the next day he has to run to Jamie to try to ask her to the dance before Marco can. Jamie? Not the child foot fetishists of Hollywood infiltrating every corner of American media. You guys are never gonna believe what happens next. Oh, you're protesting today, isn't it? Lindsay, it is totally not my fault. I asked Diana to call to see if you can move to Friday because I have this press thing to do right now. Aw, it feels like just a few minutes ago that we were setting up this third act conflict and I said something about a pus-filled egg sack. <laughs> I'm so funny. So of course, Jamie misses this animal rights thing. And I'm like, okay, I don't know what kind of animal rights. Oh, we're trying to stop animal testing. Anyway, Jamie's on TV, not having a great interview. Your book is Saves the World is the fastest selling children's book. Well, we object to the word children because it relates to everyone. We? I mean me. Keep it together, little Sybil. This is cable access television and you're blowing it. Listen, if you can't make it through this segment, we've got a pair of preteen Irish step dancers who survived a rare blood disease on deck ready to blow this thing out of the water. So you tell me. Wait, so you're saying that Is Saves the World is based on real events? Oh, I couldn't make that stuff up. I'm sorry, you couldn't make up the part about them zapping witches and wizards into a magical land? You sound so dumb right now while they're broadcasting this on the school jumbotron that exists for some reason. As you just heard, Jamie let it slip that all of her characters are based on real people. Actually, some of my fans have pointed out that Iz is no more than an alter ego of myself, but, but she isn't. Am I Iz? Is isn't. Is she? Am I Iz? 
Alrighty, we're gonna go to a commercial break while we get Jamie's mother a cute little pamphlet on locking up household medications. We'll be right back. This is supposed to show that Jamie is having her ultimate identity crisis and trying to establish her identity outside of is. Is is real? Is she real? This part of the whole movie just never really feels realized to me. Anyway, this is where Jamie really steps in it. She's about to really step in it. Everyone has a little bit of is in them and every school has a Sawyer. <laughs> I'm sorry, who's Sawyer? I thought the evil villain's name was Myrna. I didn't say Sawyer, I said Myrna, right? No, you said, you said Sawyer. We have it on tape. You hear that? We have all the receipts, you lying flop. We recorded you, dummy. You looked right in the camera and said Shmyrna instead of Myrna. And now we're gonna burn ya. I love this reporter acting like Jamie just revealed a murder detail that was withheld from the public. She said, breaking news, I'm about to tear this 13 year old a new tampon hole right on live television. That's too much. I'm gonna get angry emails for that. Don't email me, I don't have an email. I've never emailed nothing and I've never said nothing wrong. That's the British truth. Now I'm making fun of accents. This is gonna be a long day. That's the British truth. <laughs> Alrighty. Beep, boop, 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 boop. So the whole school hates her. Literally, everyone, like Myrna comes in or Sawyer comes in. She's like, she's been writing about all of us. You two are the dumb docs. Dumb jocks. Dumb docs, dumb jock. You two are the dumb jocks she was writing about. And they're like, now I'm gonna kick her ass. So they all start chasing her. School is tough. School is rough. Jamie takes it out on her brother by like pounding on her door. Oh, oh. And so basically, Jamie is like, this is it. I'm getting rid of you, Iz. But Iz is like, you can't get rid of me. I'm the best thing that's ever happened to you. Then think about your parents. Business is booming right now. So if you say goodbye to me, you say goodbye to the pizza parlor forever. You hear that, Jamie? Your dad's gonna have to get a job at the H&R Block and it's gonna be all your fault. It's not because he thinks people wanna eat chicken feet and used Kleenex flatbread. This feels like such an artificial conflict. First of all, Jamie is threatening to delete her new pages for her next book and get rid of, you know, is forever. And I'm just like, well, deleting that future book won't get rid of the problem that's already been here. So I don't really see how that's like something that's at risk right now. Also, then it comes to like, uh, well, if you get rid of me, you'll have no more pizza parlor because your parents' business is failing. And it's like, that's no different than where we were at the beginning of all of this. Maybe if she had heard that the business, they were gonna have to sell the pizza parlor when she had already decided, no, I'm not gonna write the book. And then she heard her parents be like, well, we're gonna have to sell the business unless we have some miracle happen that helps put us on the map. And then she's like, all right, I'm gonna publish this book because it's my last chance to help save the business. Then it would make this whole fame thing feel like it was really important to her and not like nothing really that different would be happening if she gave it all up. Cause that's how I feel. Also, she's burning bridges shore to shore. She yells at her brother. She's like, give up on your guitar dreams cause it's never gonna happen. Which I'm like, that's fair because he said the exact same thing to her when she was writing the book. He was like, writing a book sounds like a pipe dream. So I'm not sure why it's supposed to be like the ultimate betrayal that she yells that at him out of anger when he said it pretty casually to her at the beginning of this. Kind of a double standard there. What? The brother can hate on the sister's dreams, but the sister can't hate on the brother's dream? F him. He's too shy to play out in the goddamn open. We don't care if you can play smoke on the water or whatever the hell. We don't care, Connor. That green tea energy, that green tea organic fusion of energy is really happening. So everyone is writing letters to the editor about how they don't approve of Jamie writing about them in her book, but she's still kind of living the dream, if you will, because John Marco, the crush, still likes her. And because, you know, his portrayal in the book was pretty favorable. Meanwhile, her friends won't talk to her. Her and her boyfriend can't really find anywhere to sit at lunch. She's like, well, I like that you love poetry. You're very sensitive. And he's like, what? Okay, whatever. Meanwhile, back at the pizza parlor, business has slowed down all of a sudden. Uh, presumably because Jamie is no longer the school's favorite, but like the book would still be popular with people outside of the school, right? Like not the whole world would be mad that Jamie wrote this based on real people. So wouldn't the business still be there from people who weren't personally offended by Jamie's book. I don't know. Feels like we're really cramming a lot into the last 20 minutes here, aren't we? Yeah, because nothing's happened and now they have to resolve nothing from happening. Also, remember how Jamie convinced her and her friends to join the school dance committee? She hasn't been showing up to any of those things. So it's just been like Harmony and Lindsay working at the school dance without her. And I'm like, that is annoying, but it also feels really irrelevant. I've been thinking about what we should stuff our masterpiece with. Hacking peanuts? I was thinking of something a little more proactive. 
that this is an incredible opportunity to make a statement. And that's pretty much all you'll be doing, since this plan will not actually save even one single whale. If some goody two-shoes dumped seaweed on my school dance as a protest, it would actually turn me against her cause. I would be like, that's it, whales are canceled. Then I would go out and find a two-story long six-pack ring and drop it into the ocean with a helicopter like, good luck with that, you beautiful creatures. Save yourselves when you're eating krill. I'm obviously just kidding. Ocean, ocean, fishy swim, save these seas, Steve or win. So right now we're getting our third act montage where it's like, ugh, nobody likes me. There's a sad song playing. Jamie goes online and all of her friends are signing off, but Connor, and she's like, Connor, you don't hate me? Um, not who you think I am. Ah, so the solution is more contrived poetry. I tell you, this kid is gonna be a nightmare in college. I really hope this movie at least inspired some young writers to practice their craft because I am so sick of these musical montages. Not sick of this song though, I do remember this. You don't know how it feels to be your own best friend on the outside looking in. People are like, Nick, your singing triggers me and I'm like, bitch. Don't tell me that I got my finger on the trigger because I'm just gonna keep shooting. Anyway, the next day, Jamie reads this favorable anonymous entry in the stupid school newspaper. This all feels really outdated. This is like two years before I feel like schools would never ever print a newspaper again. Or letters to the editor in a school newspaper. I'm like, in what universe? We are geeks and jerks and jocks and all those things Jamie wrote about. Don't be embarrassed that she saw who we really were. Be embarrassed that we never really saw her. I hate the phony voice that people use when they're reading poetry. It doesn't need to sound soft and gentle just because a depressed person wrote it. Jamie is just all sorts of stupid. I don't know what else to tell you at this point. Did you see this? At least Marco thinks I'm pretty special. Huh? I'd recognize his style anywhere. It's just like his poem. It's interesting how Jamie is perceptive enough to connect the writing styles from two very different pieces, but can't tell that Marco obviously didn't write that poem that he read in front of the class. I have a secret. Does she too? The quiet girl I thought I knew who continually makes me smile. Jamie is like, yup, that checks out. So what kind of cologne are you wearing? Are you a top or a bottom? So Jamie is still under the impression that Marco somehow wrote that poem. She does not know that it was Connor and she overhears this. You know, I think you're wrong about that pate pizza peg. Well, I think you're wrong about how you pronounce pad thai, dad from Even Stevens. Ugh, where is this man getting his information on what it is that people like about eating pizza? It's the bread, the cheese, and the sauce. There is no formula to crack beyond that. They're basically like, even with the new business from the popularity of the book, we're still gonna have to sell the restaurant from our losses last year. And I'm like, okay, but isn't the book selling and making money? Like, what is Jamie doing with all that money? Can't they use any of that to help pay the bills? I'm just curious. You're in the wrong. You can tell that Jamie is really wound up right now. And I'm talking about those tight Shirley Temple curls. Interesting move to use hot rollers right before bed. You're gonna wake up looking like a golden retriever that just got off a roller coaster. The night has finally come for the school dance and Jamie is finally saying goodbye to Is Forever. She closes that laptop or her tablet or whatever and she's like, I don't wanna see you anymore. Even though it's like, it seems kind of like it's been involuntary up until this point. But Isabella finally gets to the dance that big Big whale full of seaweed is ominously waiting up there. And then Jamie is heartbroken when she somehow finds out that Margo didn't write the stupid story and that she realizes, oh my God, it was Connor. But it's too late to make any move or apologize to her friends because Jamie has just been called up on stage to give a speech because apparently that's what she does as a star of the school. And she realizes the plan. This just feels really messy, right? Like what is going, there's so many things happening in this movie, ugh. That's it. They'll ruin everything. If you rat them out before that happens and they take the fall for it, you'll be a hero. Yes, queen of snitching. We stan a freshman narc. I don't understand what's going on. It feels like this script itself was written by a 14 year old who's making it up on the spot. They're like, and then she sees that they're gonna make the seaweed fall. So Iz tells her she has to tell on them. It's like, didn't we just tell Iz to go away for the whole thing? That's supposed to be the conflict. Like I can't get rid of Iz, she's not going away. And I'm just like, yeah, I know. I don't know why she's been here from the beginning. Iz's inclusion through this whole thing has felt really confusing. Like, 
like they used the marketing materials of the movie to even be like, oh, we've got two sisters playing characters. It's like, what? why though? Why? But Jamie uses the microphone to apologize to her two friends, to apologize to the whole school for embarrassing them. And then she does this. And believe it or not, that somehow saved 300 whales from being flushed down the toilet at SeaWorld. I saw that documentary, Blackfish, and it was so scary. Who knew fish could get that big? As soon as she pulls it, this big, huge whale starts swinging, and I'm like, okay, someone's gonna die. Not Sawyer acting like the Wicked Witch of the West. Is that seaweed soaked with hydrochloric acid or is her hairstyle just very sensitive to moisture? At this dance, it is chaos. It is destruction. It is liability. You cannot tell me this whale spillage does not feel inspired by Carrie White's Night Under the Stars. The only difference is I actually feel like some of these kids deserve to burn alive just for being part of such a lazy movie. This somehow saves the day and then the brother comes out of his shell and finally performs on stage for the first time even though he's never practiced before. Ah yes, trendy song sounds, teens be jumping, end of movie party time. That's what this is right now, just like general wrap up. Of course the business is saved because after the dance, Jamie brings all of her friends back to the restaurant and that's when things get really good. That girl said, mmm, this pizza is so deliza that I'm just gonna let it soften inside of my mouth. Also, I'm not loving that these kids are eating pizza covered with seaweed that fell out of the brother's blazer after he spent a full set jumping around performing pop punk music. Mmm, this pizza smells like Old Spice and armpit hair. Seaweed? I think this could be it. Listen to those kids. Go get the seaweed from the sushi in the cooler. Mm, we did it. Yay, you did it by doing nothing. Meanwhile, another dead whale just washed up on the beach somewhere while those protest flyers get shoveled into a furnace. So I guess not everything gets a resolution, does it? Not for the whales. But it is a happy ever after. Happy ever afting for our goddamn Jamie. And everyone lives happily ever after. <laughs> Everyone. But this character doesn't even exist, so what does that even mean? Jamie, are you still having hallucinations to this day? Honey, are you sure we scraped all of that weird fungus off of that rotten pizza dough we thought out? Anyway, that's all she wrote. <sighs> 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 for read it and weep. I don't think I've ever seen a Disney Channel movie this bad. It had no substance to it, no flavor, zero originality, terrible use of his low budget, awful dialogue, bad editing, shit writing, awful characters. <laughs> <laughs> I hated it. I really did. Wow. It's kind of refreshing to see a movie this bad because I'm like, after Princess Diaries 2, I was like, oh, lovely cinematography, beautiful film grain. Nope, mom. This is just rotten grain. Rotten grain killing the horses. Anyway, what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. Did you love this one for some reason? I could see being a young writer being like, oh, this teaches me the power of the pen. But I mean, watching it back as an adult, I'm like, oh, trachea, pen, trachea, pen in the trachea. Let me know what you guys think. Also, give this video a big thumbs up if you want to see even more clip breakdowns on DCOM originals like this. But most importantly, if you're new to my channel, I would love to have you click that subscribe button right over here. That way you never miss new videos from me. I upload two new ones every week. So turn on notifications and you'll always be the first to know when I've got a new pizza coming out of the oven covered in seaweed for you. Also, I've got merch available and a Patreon where you can access exclusive episodes of clip breakdown and virtual watch parties. You guys are all the greatest. Thank you so much for dancing with me today. Read it and weep. I will see you next time.